I want to ask you guys, uh, I, it's hard not to just start with the, the main news. Uh, have all of you been suspended from Twitter? And, uh, and should we just pool our money and buy it? And when I say pool our money, I mean, Mark, will you buy it? Yeah, I kind of figured. It, it's Elon's company. Elon gets to do what Elon wants to do. He, play, he paid the price for admission. You know, win, lose, or draw, we'll find out. Yeah, it's it's kind of nice to see it in this uh, arbitrary, pernicious state. Uh, you mean state. free I, speech absolutism? Is that, that what you that's mean, John? Exact, that, okay. that, I believe that's what I meant. By the okay. way, he who controls the chalkboard controls the absolutism. Now, the, 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 the person that I think has the most at stake here, if we're being honest, is Maria Ressa, who faces censorship uh, and the penalty of imprisonment in the Philippines. And so it's very easy for us to sit here and, and watch glibly. But for Maria, I, I'm assuming th this is a, a chilling bit of a turn of events. I think it's both chilling and instructional. You know, it really shows mm -hmm. you the ba basic question is, why does one rich man have that much power over the public sphere globally? You know, and uh, it has never happened this way. Uh, in the past. And this platform in particular, because of its design, is global mm -hmm. in scope. So um, that's, and I think this is part of what we've been trying to point out is that in the medium term, to just try to fix everything that is wrong, fix the information ecosystem, which means stop what social media has done, put guardrails on these. And, and what is happening on Twitter is a perfect example why you need this. Well, that's it. So Mark, you know this cat, Mark. You know, you know Elon. Bit, yeah. You're excited to to see him take it over because you thought you, he could use. But it's pretty clear that there's a fine line between being a disruptor and being a the king. utterly narcissistic <laughs> yeah, anarchist, king. sanctimonious nutbag dictator. What the fuck happened? It's Rupert Murdoch on a different platform. You know, it's uh, always been this way. It's not It's not something new. It's always been this way. Walter Cronkite decided what went on his show. You know, Rupert Murdoch has been for corporate advocacy since Rupert Murdoch was born. You know, right. there's, there's just, it's just a different platform. And so we're starting to understand. And look, and even with the Twitter files with, you know, even though there was no there there, we got insight into how Twitter worked and their decision making process. And while mm -hmm. they try to stick to their terms of service, there's always going to be a gray area where decisions are made about information. And so we're just getting, the, you know, in this particular case, the guy making the sausage is showing his recipe, even though he's saying he's making cupcakes, he's making hot dogs, right? And we're getting to see how they're made. Mark, have you had breakfast yet? Because it seems to me that uh, a, a lot of these food analogies may be based on... you. Right here. <laughs> there you go, baby. That's what I'm talking about. My list of healthy uh, cookies. Oh, that's 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 delightful. Julia, uh, as a journalist, you've also got to be thinking to yourself, well, how, if I don't know where the mines are buried, I don't know where not to step. And my entire job is based on not treading lightly, but but walking into this. The problem is, you know, he made a big deal of Twitter files showing the corruption within the decision-making process of moderating this free speech town square platform. I would bet you a Twitter files from the last 24 yeah. hours would be a <laughs> tiny yeah. release because it would just be, Elon, what should we do? Answer, fuck these guys, get them all done. He just shut down Twitter spaces because one of those journalists confronted him on the fact that he didn't dox Elon, he was just mm -hmm. reporting on it. So Julia, what for a, forget about guardrails, where's the map? What's the rule of the road here? Well, I do think it's interesting that these self-declared uh, free speech absolutists are absolute and protecting their own speech, right? It's, it's free speech for them, but for really nobody else, especially if it's speech criticizing them, then that's really... Uh, really out of bounds. Mm -hmm. um, look, I think that it's always been a Twitter has always been a fraught space for journalists. And I imagine that there are a lot of editors that are watching this with some relief. And then they're like, oh, good. You know, just blow, blow this thing up. 
And let's just not have any journalists on Twitter because Twitter has given so many editors, so many of our bosses, such, you know, spilkes in the Ganectagazoink because, <laughs> because, wow. because. Okay, let, let me just, let me just stop you right there. What a beautiful tribute to Hanukkah. Uh, up. Oh my to God. Have... I thought my grandparents just jumped on and said something. There is there is a punim that is that is that is smiling. That is very shameful. There you go. It's Linda Richmond. Anyway, but, but you bring um, up a great point. Right, because they were always freaking out that we were saying things that would um compromise our objectivity or that would get us in trouble and i've gotten in trouble mm -hmm. on there a fair amount of times and there was there was so much hand wringing in um on kind of an in editorial that i think the public didn't see and i think there's a lot of there are a lot of editors that are just hoping that this thing just blows up and this way it'll look like it's not that that the editors are kind of turning the screws on their journalists which they've been doing for years by the way including mm -hmm. at publications like the atlantic the washington post the new york times um but that it'll look like big bad elon musk has come down uh has come out and shut down twitter for journalists and um they were trying to protect free speech well let's go let's let's flip it on its head you know, you could also say that uh, journalists and editors and, and publications are just upset that they've lost the gatekeeping powers that had formerly been invested in them and that they had wielded that authority uh, perniciously and, uh, and in a partisan way. And so this is the revenge of the revenge of the free speech libertarians. But on the flip side of that, couldn't you make a case that Twitter blowing up is a good thing for journalists because they're so wedded to its circadian rhythm as though it's news that journalists have turned this space into reality when in fact Twitter is not reality. Well, I think it emerged, I think it became a really important platform because of journalists because and because of people mm -hmm. who acted like they were journalists. It was a kind of news feed and a bespoke news feed a, for a, a lot of people. A crowdsourced for yeah, only for journalists, yeah, and, only for journalists, right? Because, well, you know, John, I don't necessarily agree that this is good for journalists. In one respect, it's good because everybody wants to hate the king and they get to do it in their own way, right? So everybody unifies mm -hmm. in that perspective. But the other side of the coin is everything is long tail. You know, the, the beauty of Twitter is you're able to accumulate followers, right? It's not algorithmically driven. Yes, and build a brand on there. Yeah, and you're able to define your brand. It's not like TikTok where it's all algorithmic and followers don't really have an impact. It's very much chronological and it's very much follower driven where, mm -hmm. you know, everybody at the in the early days of Twitter, when it evolved from being a social medium, hey, what are you doing at South by Southwest tonight to, hey, let's get my news or let me promote something. Mm -hmm. Now it, it's very much, it's very different and it's very, it's very brand driven. I think it actually created a lot of journalists and, and, and opened and, and kind of lay, leveled the playing field and, cre and allowed a lot of people into the profession, not just of journalism, but comedy, uh, other kinds of storytelling that wouldn't have made it into these traditionally very elite spaces that are very hard mm -hmm. to break into. That's one. And then back to your original question to turn it back on its head again, you know, um, Elon bought this uh, platform in part because conservatives were saying, you know, us being shadow banned on Twitter, us being demoted on Twitter is a violation of our First Amendment rights. And liberals, ironically, were saying, well, this is a, this is a, a private company. They can do whatever they want. And they I were saying, no, no, no. I think you're giving no, Elon no. too much credit. Yeah, I think you're giving Elon too much credit. Well, well but so so hold on. But no, no, no. But, but what, what, whether that was his thought process or not. But now that he mm -hmm. owns it. Uh, now conservatives are saying, well, now it's a private company. He can do whatever he wants and it's not a first amendment, right? Right. So now it turns out again, they're not free speech. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, like everything else, it becomes a, a tit for tat ownership over libs or conservatives. But my point is more this, isn't it a problem if journalists view the ranking of trends on Twitter, if aren't you outsourcing your editorial authority? by just, and I do think journalists have done this and newsrooms have done this. They scan Twitter and they look at the trend and they look at how it's ranked and they decide, oh, that's the top story. 
That's the most important thing going on in the world right now. That's the urgency. And you see how it influences coverage. I mean, it's more than that, right? Like, so I would disagree with something Mark said that it isn't just Elon kind of, you know, being the owner and the gatekeeper of this. These are his rules. So he exercises the power media used to exercise. Uh, we yeah. never could exercise this kind of power because the power of technology is significantly different from traditional media where we all saw the same thing, where our where we weren't cloned as, you know, where data privacy is thrown out the door and, and uh, mm -hmm. algorithms of amplification determine, actually on Twitter in, in particular, lies spread at least six times faster than really boring facts. So from the very beginning, Wait, this that's been platform, quantified at six times, Maria? Six this is times an, faster? Yeah, this is an MIT study from 2018. Lies oh, spread wow. at least six times faster than facts on social media. And then you add right. on top of that, that, you know, it is the kind of um, weaknesses of it, uh, the way it was set up to basically keep you scrolling, right? Because that's the end goal of this. Keep you scrolling. Sure. So the platform it's monetized makes money. by engagement and the amount of time you spend on it. That's how they make the and money. And it has... And it has actually uh, gotten rid of, you know, it has atomized meaning and, and given flattened what engagement even means. But because it just wants to make money out of us, it has uh, come in, used our biology against us, used, man insidiously manipulated our emotion and wow. a system of advertising and marketing that was once advertising and marketing has now been used for political power and geopolitical power. So this is insidious manipulation. And this is now a behavior modification system. And we're Pavlov's Boom. dogs. And where is this okay?